All right, now we're going to go to Tim Ferriss. He is the New York Times best-selling uh, author of The 4-Hour Workweek, Escape 9 to 5, Live Anywhere, and Join the New Rich. And it's now expanded and updated with over 100 new pages of cutting-edge content, according to uh, what I've got in front of me. Uh, Tim, welcome to the Young Turks. I'm sorry, say that one more time, please. Uh, I said, welcome to the Young Turks. Um, okay. So oh, welcome to the Young Turks. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, no problem. Look, Tim, uh, I, I've got your book, actually. And, um, and my wife bought it, and she really likes it. I have to confess that I'm a little bit more skeptical. Uh, but let's start with the good stuff. Um, she uh, thinks that it, you know, it has a lot of very helpful information in it. And, uh, and she wanted me to ask you, because she was excited that you're going to come on. Mm -hmm. And she said I shouldn't say that, but I, there, I just said it. <laughs> Um, uh, she wanted me to ask you, how, how did you break through? I mean, how did you go from, you know, not being a published author to all of a sudden having a New York Times number one bestseller? What was the turning point? The turning point, well, there are two turning points. Uh, I never intended on being an author. Uh, the two turning points were, number one, uh, having students at, uh, at Princeton University, where I speak twice a year in high-tech entrepreneurship, suggest that I try to apply some of the, the startup uh, techniques that I've been researching to personal life. And then secondly, having a long-term girlfriend in 2004, uh, whom I came very close to uh, becoming engaged with, uh, end the relationship and give me a plaque that said business hours end at 5 p.m. as a reminder, uh, because my schedule was 7 to 9 p.m., 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. at the time. Um, as far as the author piece, it really came much later when I spent uh, two years collecting case studies of people who'd reduced their workloads you know, 20 to 80 percent without sacrificing income, ranging from CEOs to you know, single mothers. Uh, and an author friend of mine uh, half-jokingly suggested that I make it a book. And uh, the turning point, if I were to point to, if I had to bring marketing and so forth into it, would be uh, four or five specific bloggers uh, taking a liking to the book very early on in the technology circles. And that was really what catapulted the book to its, its, its first stage and where it is now. But it was, it was turned down by 26 out of 27 publishers. So the fact that it ended up in you know, number one New York Times, number one Wall Street Journal, et cetera, is, was a huge surprise to everyone, including myself. Well, that is a very interesting story, and it's inspirational because, you know, a lot of people have had their work, you know, rejected, et cetera. But, you know, it turns out, uh, that of course, 26 out of 27 people in power might have no freaking idea what they're doing. Uh, so it, I'm curious about the bloggers. One more question about that. Uh, sure. Who are the four or five bloggers? Were they business writers, more tech writers? And how did that lead to so many more people uh, getting into the book and buying the book? So the, uh, the, the bloggers were, there were a number of them. Uh, one was Merlin Mann, who runs a site called 43 Folders, which is a productivity site focusing on technology and, and also something called Getting Things Done, a uh, popular productivity system. Uh, the second was Robert Scoble, uh, who's, who used to work at Microsoft and uh, was sort of an internal critic, uh, but also promoter of the technology they were developing also in the technology world. And uh, then Brian Oberkirk, also I would consider him a thought leader in the technology world. All three of these people were from the, the startup Silicon Valley culture. And uh, I think part of the reason that it appealed to them and spread as quickly as it did is because it addresses a few pains that they have, perhaps more so than anyone else, uh, such as information overwhelm. And... Uh, most of the books that I think have, have been published before that fit neatly into, let's say, time management uh, focus on either uh, foregoing money and assuming it's unimportant, so just being happy with less and stepping out of the rat race, or uh, they're a how-to to becoming Jack Welch and running a Fortune 500 company. I feel like most people fall somewhere in between those two points. And one of the uh, positives your, of your book is to for people to realize, hey, listen, you know what? I don't have to be Bill Gates, and so it's you can't. You're, you're not necessarily getting the best of both worlds. Okay, I'm going to teach you how to be a billionaire, but at the same time, you're going to work 13 minutes a day. Uh, but then I do get to my skepticism, Tim, which sure. is uh, four hours inconceivable. <laughs> inconceivable. <laughs> no, and uh, you're right to be skeptical. Uh, and you know, certainly in 2004, uh, up to 2004, I would have been in the, in, in the same boat. And uh, it's not to say, uh, and it's not just a made-up term for marketing purposes. There are case studies of people in the book who've reduced their work to four hours or, or less per week, meaning that what they do to create 
financial stability. Uh, but there are other examples of people who simply want to reduce their work week from 80 hours a week to 40 hours a week, uh, which is the same number of hours as going from 40 to zero, but it's, it's a very uh, different effect and, in fact, more important, I think. Um, other people simply don't want to stop working on the weekends. And so, I mean, I can give you a very simple example of uh, a, a very fast way that someone could hypothetically save four or five hours. And uh, for that matter, I don't distinguish between uh, minutia and errands that you run for your personal life and minutia and errands that you would run for your business life. I think both are relatively a waste of your personal time. Um, so one thing that people could experiment with uh, today, you don't have to buy the book for this, is to go to asksunday.com, A-S-K-S-U-N-D-A-Y.com. And what that does is gives anyone, even if they make $30,000 a year, the ability to have a 24-7 on-call virtual assistant. And the way that someone might use that, because maybe you don't have Excel spreadsheets to send over, uh, is if you're doing holiday shopping and your kids want the hot two new toys of the season, but they're sold out everywhere, You call a 212 number, New York number, routes you to a virtual assistant in India or the Philippines who speaks near perfect English, and you ask them to call every toy store within 15 miles of your home address, uh, locate uh, those two toys, reserve them behind the counter wherever they might be, and then call you and give you the location of where they are. And that would be a very simple way to preserve, let's say, your hard-fought weekend as opposed to spending spending four or five hours traveling from store to store. And there are a lot of very clever lateral workarounds like that that people can use to effectively achieve what they perceive to be the lifestyle of a millionaire without having to accumulate a million dollars. I want to talk about my example, and I want to see if you can get me from 80 to 40 hours a week. But before we do that, I just... I don't think you even work four-hour work weeks. I mean, that, you're using that as an extreme example, right? I mean, nobody's really expected to work a four-hour work week. Uh, well, I don't. I, I expect people to to try to design a lifestyle that they enjoy. For many people, that's doing what they love, and that could be 40, 60, 70 hours a week, um, as is the case with you know a lot of people who are fans of the book, like Tony Shea, who just sold his company Zappos for a billion dollars to Amazon. Um, in my particular case, that number is a real number. Uh, in, from 2005, when I was running a, a multinational company uh, with between two and four hours of management a week. Um, these days, I'm spending more time on things that I like to do. I mean, certainly I'm doing a book launch for a week, and that's not a four-hour work week. <laughs> right. But uh, in general, um, really having the ability to say no to anything that you want to say no to is incredibly empowering. And I think that it's it takes time for people to get to that point, but it's it's surprisingly less difficult than people realize. Uh, okay, I, I just wanted to get to the sense that it wasn't literal, because uh, obviously I know what it do- takes to launch a book, and there's no way it's done in four hours a week. I mean, we just spent ten minutes. I mean, right. tick-tock, tick-tock. Yep. Right? So, I mean, we do a four-hour show every day, pretty much, once you include the post-game. So uh, I'm out of luck. <laughs> so, but, no, understood. So, <laughs> right. So, yeah, but so, let's, let's get it real, though. Let's get it real. Uh, you uh, know, and I work I- at least 80 hours a week, I got to do the marketing for the show today. I had an interview with Russian TV. Uh, I got, you know, we I, I get emails, but they're emails related to the things that I have to read for the show. I have to prepare the show. I have to do the show. Uh, we have the business side of it. It goes on and on. Mm-hmm. So how do I knock it down? Uh, so th- the way that you would decrease that, I-, I would say there are a couple of things I would do, um, and and these are just as an aside, the same principles that I work with companies like Google and Microsoft to implement. So it's not just for rare uh, exceptions. <clears throat> so the first thing I would do is is do an 80-20 analysis of your activities. In other words, uh, if, if the one of the primary objectives is to be compensated, then what are the 20% of activities that are producing 80% of the results that determine that, that financial outcome, right? So you, you do that piece. Then conversely, you look at the, the 20% of activities that are consuming 80% or plus uh, more of your time. And what you'll generally find, uh, I mean, I don't know that many people involved with radio, but a handful of them, uh, I don't think most people appreciate how much time goes into preparing these shows. Uh, it's a lot of time, generally. And uh, right. that research and uh, a lot of the marketing and the setup and the scheduling and the calendaring and so forth can be very effectively handled by someone that you would not need to pay more than 5 or $10 an hour for. Um, and in many cases, you could also, for example, just spoke with someone today who did this in radio, in fact, uh, find an MBA program nearby that would give credit to a very intelligent 
uh, postgraduate student who would then handle a lot of these things for you at no cost. Uh, so that would be at least, uh, obviously, from a very superficial level, one of the, f- the first things that I would do is basically a time audit and then look at what things are dependent on your unique skill set, which you obviously have or you wouldn't be in this position, uh, and then what things can be really taught uh, or, or, or uh, offloaded to someone else. You know, and that's, and that's the, in my opinion, the essence of your book. Because here, you know, again, uh, when you take it literally, I don't, I, I'm going to be honest, I'm not buying it. And I'll tell you why. Because I, I got to read the articles. I can't have a, an intern read the articles. I have to read them, right? And so I have to acquire that knowledge. And then the show takes uh, a lot of time, et cetera. And then uh, what we spend 80% of our time on uh, doesn't bring us 20% of our revenue, to use this as a business, you know, uh, example. What we spend 80% of our time in is the show, and it brings in 100% of the revenue. I mean, you know, give or take. So I, I get those limitations, but there is a kernel in there that I think is very, very helpful to people. That if you look at it from that perspective, you see, oh, well, you know, I do spend a lot of time on this, and it doesn't really give me that much return. Maybe I could do without. And people get attached to certain things, and it's hard for them to let it go, and, and they can't really let that go. And 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 I think that a book like yours helps them to streamline a little better and go, oh, yeah, well, I didn't think about it that way. So in that light, I know you've got 100 new pages uh, that you're adding to the book. Give me something new from those 100 pages that could be helpful to people. So uh, I I will. I mean, most of those 100 pages, almost all of them, are actually real-life case studies. Um, That's why I did the expanded edition. Otherwise, I didn't feel like there was much to add. Um, But uh, in in terms of something that would be helpful to people, I think – um, for free, you don't have to buy the book for this. This is what I'm going to suggest people do: is, is go to fourhourworkweek.com. It's a top 1,000 blog, and look at some of the case studies. Um, look at the families who are exploring some of these options. These are middle-class people, many of whom are traveling for the first time in their lives for six to 12 months and coming back with more in their bank accounts than they had when they left. Um, but I want to point out something that you brought up, which is very important, and that is that these this book is not for everyone. In other words. Um, there are certain jobs, like radio, uh, like uh, if you're, you know, I get asked very often, like, what about the bricklayer? What about the taxi driver? If they own their own business, there's a, there are things they can apply. But otherwise, they're going to have to find a different profession. I mean, if they've chosen that, there are limitations to what they can do. And radio would certainly apply. But if, if someone's in front of a computer or on a telephone for most of the day, uh, generally speaking, there's a lot more room uh, for making some pretty radical changes. All right, Tim Ferriss, the author of The 4-Hour Workweek, we really appreciate you joining us and taking your time out to do that here in The Young Turks. Can't get enough of The Young Turks? Well, then subscribe to the TYT's YouTube channel. What's the matter with you?